Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's Health Tech Summit panel on AI and the healthcare revolution. My name is Nicola Blackwood, and I'm chair of Genomics England, and I will be your chair for this session. I don't think I need to tell any of you that artificial intelligence AI is just poised to really change the healthcare and life sciences industry in ways that we couldn't have imagined only years ago. And we probably can't really imagine how it will change going forward, given the, the transformation that we've seen already. Um, we're seeing it in vaccine development, in patient care, in research, um, from telemedicine to strides in detecting um, new COVID uh, variants. We, we are living now, I think, in the age where um, healthcare AI is, is really a thing. Um, but but getting to these breakthrough developments um, starts um, in smaller increments than the actual breakthrough. It's the technologies, the tools, the triumphs, the failures, and often um, those are really less talked about aspects of creating accurate, effective, and responsible AI solutions. So I think that surfacing and promoting understanding of those parts of the equation, the real foundations and preconditions for successful AI-driven revolution in healthcare is gonna be vital for success and progress. So I'm really delighted that here today to help us think through what that looks like in practice, not just today, but over the next decade or so, we have a fantastic panel. Uh, we have with us uh, Jacob West, who leads health and life sciences for Microsoft UK and has a track record of driving innovation and change in the NHS nationally and locally, which I think we know is not for the faint hearted. We have Per Vergard, who is the CEO of a great Cambridge based unicorn, CMR Surgical, um, who put up with me visiting and trying out their tech. So I'm really grateful for that. And he has more than 25 years of significant global growth and business scaling experience in the field of robotics. And we have the brilliant Sam Barrow who is a clinician and the chief operating officer of the Francis Crick Institute, which is Europe's largest biomedical institute. And she joined their following, you know, a really distinguished career in the NHS as a healthcare leader. And this included being chief executive of Taunton and Somerset NHS Foundation Trust. So I'm going to stop talking now because these are our experts for you today. And I'm going to put to them um, the exam question, what does the next decade of AI and healthcare look like? Uh, and I'm going to throw that over first of all to you, Sam. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think there'll be a marked acceleration in the adoption of technology by healthcare in the next 10 years, as you've said. But I think we just need to think back to the, the pandemic. We did see rapid improvement in the use of technology with healthcare in the UK, with the use of virtual consultations, online booking of appointments, virtual wards, remote patient monitoring and healthcare apps. But however, the point to make is most of this was supported by more basic IT and the fact that these are even flagged as progress or more novel show just how far behind other industries I think healthcare is in terms of extracting benefit from IT solutions. There's also of course the potential for more machine learning and AI to become transformative in the next decade for healthcare but there are some key challenges to get over such as the right governance and trust models to allow data movement data security and interoperability, data quality, data scale, and of course, and most importantly, operational pathways will need redesigning. Technologies need to be aligned with, not create additional clinical workflows, so as not to create additional burden for clinicians. If we can make good progress on overcoming these challenges in the next 10 years, I think we could be seeing seven key areas of improvement to healthcare using technology and AI. Firstly, a much enhanced patient experience. The data is shared safely and effectively, so all involved in care understands the patient's clinical needs. So whether you go to your hospital, the physio, your GP, all understand your needs without you having to repeat constantly the information. As a patient, I hope you will also additionally be able to access your own records and results. And all of that isn't without some significant challenge, so I shouldn't really have to say I hope, but I think, I think it is with some challenge. Secondly, a more flexible and efficient user experience that allows where safe to do so, patients to choose whether they prefer a virtual meeting instead of a face-to-face -face appointment and more one-stop shop approaches for diagnostics and consultations. I think we need enhanced, we will have enhanced awareness of self-care through apps and wearable technologies. Clinici clinicians will definitely be able to use clinical data collected remotely to inform decision making and manage patients, such as via virtual wards, which you saw some very good examples of in the pandemic, and chronic disease monitoring platforms. I think we'll be able to make more use of predictive tools, triage and diagnosis, such as AI used in imaging analysis for radiology or pathology, 
and there'll be more widespread use of robotics to assist with surgery and many other procedures, more, and more personalised approaches to clinical therapy. But finally, what really also excites me, and you mentioned it briefly in your introduction, Nicola, is machine learning and AI could really transform the productivity of discovery science. For example, Google, DeepMind, AlphaFold could offer a step change in structural biology. So the future is exciting, but expectations need to be kept realistic as we need to sort out the basics first before we can really harness the potential of AI in the next decade for healthcare. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Sam. And that's a great segue um, over to Pear, who has been working on uh, building and rolling out uh, tech in the market. So Pear, over to you. Yeah, no, I think, I think obviously um, AI, and I also agree with Sam, actually to include machine learning will, will play an important role uh, in healthcare moving forward. I also agree that I think there is uh, still quite a lot of hype though, uh, and uh, I think it is uh, important to sort of put it in context and to make sure that we are focusing uh, on, on where it can uh, be used in a, in, a, in a good way. If I'm looking at from our side, from a surgical robotic point of view, um, if you're looking at uh, traditionally uh, surgeries, which have been open surgery or a manual lap or manual keyhole surgery, there has been really no opportunity to gather any data or at least very little uh, little data. But when you're adding in a robotics between basically the patient and the surgeon, you have the opportunity to gather a lot of data from, from the robotic and from the, 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 um, yeah, the procedure in itself. And if we match that with also clinical data that we're also gathering uh, through some of the systems we have, we have an opportunity to have a lot of data that we can sort of analyze. And I think that is one of the areas where I really see AI and machine learning going to help us to really work on a huge amount of data. And somehow the data in itself, of course, doesn't have a lot of value if we can't do any analysis on it. And I think that's really where, where, I, where I see it. Sometimes, um, and I have actually, as you mentioned, um, Nicola, I've been working also in another part of uh, the robotics field in the industrial side where the robot actually are automated and actually do a task that has been programmed to do. And in that context, uh, robotics can be, or AI machine learning can be used in a slightly different way. But if you look at a, how a surgical robotic is used, it's actually a kind of what we call a master slave type of a movement that is actually still the doctor, the surgeon who controls every movement of it. So the, the, the use of AI machine learning in the surgical robotic area is in many ways quite differently, but still it have a role. It can help the doctors to get feedback on how they can improve the efficiency, how they can improve safety. We could um, foresee uh, areas where uh, we make no-go zones just to mention a few few areas. So I definitely believe um, AI machine learning will be and will help us a lot moving forward. But I think it is important also to understand that it is kind of a hype and we just need to make sure that we are putting the, the effort and the energy into the right parts of it. Thank you very much. Um, a reality check there from you, Per, which I think is always important. Um, over to you, Jacob. Thanks, Nicola. I think Probably for me, the, the most important overarching trend in the field is the emergence of what I would call intelligent health systems, where variations in data feed a sort of continual feedback loop to inform patients, clinicians, managers, policymakers, linked to a single digital health infrastructure. In a way, that's the, I think, the sort of utopian um, state that we're we're working towards. And that that's powered by multimodal data, data which is exploding uh, from all sorts of different sources, AI, new technologies, as well as enhanced computing power. And if you, if you put that together, you see how healthcare and biomedical research and technology are increasingly converging. And AI, I think, is, uh, is at the apex of that. So three things, Sam had seven, I've only got three, but for three, three areas I'd call out in particular over the next decade, and some of these are shorter term, some are longer term. The first one is what I would call connected patient care. And by the way, there's a nice paper in the RCP journals that my colleague Janae Badgewa and others at Microsoft Research wrote that set some of this out. So connected patient care, um, it's how citizens digitally engage in their own healthcare 
Um, AI chatbots are, uh, 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 you know, one example in the nearer term of that. Uh, I think ambient clinical intelligence is is a hugely exciting, uh, um, it's got hugely exciting potential. It can transform the patient clinician encounter. And, and then longer term, you can start to think about autonomous health assistants, almost if you like a Spotify for healthcare. I think the second area is around diagnostics. And really, that's probably the, the, the most near term application of AI and machine learning, isn't it? I think there's a recent review that showed that over half of all approvals for AI or machine learning based medical devices were for radiological use. So this this is its most current and widespread application. Um, I would say, you know, the exciting thing is when we start to see some of those applications really scale up because there are still challenges in scaling from demonstration and from um, from starter sites. One example that we're really excited about um, is InRI, uh, working with Adderbridge Hospital in Cambridge to design and test an AI-powered software tool to allow oncologists to achieve 3D contouring of, of patient scans in the minutes uh, rather than the hours, uh, both providing a more targeted radiotherapy plan, but also saving time and money. Other examples uh, I would put in the same bracket would be uh, Echo Go, come from Ultromics, um, AI powered um, heart scans. And then in breast cancer, I think what Chiron Medical are doing is, is really exciting. And there were, I think there were over a million women who missed their appointments during the pandemic. So this is really important in terms of, you know, here and now problems, managing the, the backlog of, uh, of elective care. And then the third area, which Sam already touched on, is, is around therapeutics and research. So at every stage of the sort of discovery science life cycle, you can think about the potential application of AI from AI assisted drug discovery, uh, developing new treatments through synthetic biology and other techniques. We already see some of that through CRISPR, gene editing and so on. Uh, uh, clinical trials reimagined, so the in silico trial, uh, the digital twin, th these are all applications, some of them further away, some of them nearer term. That, that when you add them back together, uh, I think start to create this intelligent healthcare system. Our chief executive, Satya Nadella, uses this quote, AI is technology's most important priority and healthcare is its most urgent application. And who would be, I be to disagree with the boss, right? <laughs> and I think you have more than three areas. <laughs> they were just <laughs> in <inside. laughs> Very good. So this is a great way to start off discussion. So um, this is why you're here as our expert panel. Very exciting. Um, but there was a particular point that you made, Jacob, and also uh, Per a little bit. And I, you know, I want, I want to pull it out. It was the challenges uh, with scaling and and some of these um, foundational issues because, um, as you say, we're we're kind of in the foothills of um, getting into um, AI applications, safe and appropriate AI applications in healthcare. Um, and it starts with, you know, good data, ethical use, um, regulatory um, appropriate, um, you know, responses. So can, can we start with thinking about, you know, what are some of these barriers um, and, and how do we respond to them appropriately? Perhaps we could start with, you know, accessing good quality data, you know, let alone timely data. You mentioned this pair, you know, it's, it's challenging in every country. <laughs> UK is no different. Are we making progress? You know, what more could be done in an appropriate way that brings patients and clinicians with us? As you mentioned it, I'll start with you, Pat. Yeah, I think uh, really the the um, the ability to standardize sort of the output of the data collected, because obviously as a company who are dealing with, uh, with uh, all the NHS hospitals in, in the UK, we see that not at every hospital, but very many of them are using different type of uh, databases or different software uh, and to be able to connect to the data. We, have, we obviously we are gathering quite a lot of data from our own system and obviously that one we have no difficulties to, 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 to standardize and to get in, in, in the same format across different hospitals. But when we are working with different hospitals around uh, NHS Trust around in the UK, we just see that the interfaces and the software used. So I think being able to, to, to standardize because it is the big volumes, if you're going to also use AI machine learning, obviously it is the is, is the big data that you need in order to get, in my opinion, uh, really value out of it. So somehow trying to find ways to standardize or at least making easy connection to, to the, the different uh, patient um, uh, patient data. Number one, I think number two, obviously, 
um, the trust issue uh, will be important uh, in uh, the, the, the way we deal with data, um, cyber security, anonymous, uh, or making all the, the, the different uh, surgeries that we are looking into, obviously anonymous from a patient point of view, uh, will be important because I think trust that actually data will be uh, allowed to take out and be looked at and analyzed will, will be important. So at least a couple of points there. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, Sam, from a research side, obviously there were some changes um, during COVID with the COPE regulations. Um, I mean, what, what's your impression? How can this um, how can this change going forward to make um, data and health data sharing uh, more appropriate for the development of uh, these um, you know really important technologies? I mean, I just wanted, if you don't mind, to give you a very brief example that we experienced um, at uh, the Crick last year when we were helping with a pandemic challenge. We rapidly became a PCR testing lab, which we weren't before in a very short space of time. I just want to just give you our, our experience. It, it, actually, there was some fantastic, I don't want to knock um, some of the other aspects of the experience, which is amazing. It's amazing having the collaboration with the NHS and, and, and that's going to be a really lasting uh, testament to um, us and, and, and future relationships, etc. But when we were receiving samples from the NHS, we um, were testing um, from 15 different sites. We were testing lots of hospitals in North London, and we um, had to follow eight different process pathways for the physical sample and associated data transfer. Some had one barcode all the way through the journey, so the sample data followed by a system interface. Some swapped barcodes when at the pathology lab. Some had no barcode, but a paper form which had to be typed into a system and a barcode applied. Some had a system generated paper form which had to be scanned into a different system at the lab as the data interface wasn't possible. Some sites held the test result data against the patient records. Some used IT systems supplied by the pathology partner lab. Some held no local records of the results. And one hospital was unable to change their patient system to accommodate staff testing. So samples arriving from one site followed two different processes. So I, I think this is just an example of, of, of needing to walk before we run and re really thinking about how we get, um, as, as, as Pear said, standardised um, data processes, how we join big data sets so we have a common patient, patient met metadata, and with everyone having different governance and, and IT systems across the NHS, uh, we're still a long way off thinking how we can achieve this. Obviously, we need to achieve it at, at, at a national level. Yeah, we've got to get the wiring right. I mean, if that's your experience as Europe's largest biomedical institute, imagine what that would be like if you were an SME um, or a startup. Um, Jacob, how can we um, take this forward a bit um, while still maintaining uh, public trust and clinician support, given you know they're dealing with a lot with the with the after effects of COVID, and in order to standardise data and restructure data processes, it does require. Um, you know, workflow um, adjustments. Thanks, Nicola. So, so a couple of points. I think that, that, you know, it's worth reminding ourselves there was a step change in how data was ingested, curated, displayed, communicated during the pandemic in the, in the UK context and presumably in, 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 in every other country in a way that's quite, quite amazing, really. So I think we should um sort of take a step back and and reflect on that for, for a moment I, I do think it's unfortunate that the, the sort of halo ex effect that one might have expected in terms of if you like the public acceptance or, around the use of their data and sharing of data has, has probably been set back by the, uh, the the gp data sharing exercise um but hopefully that can be retrieved uh, a, a couple of additional points um the data doesn't always exist in the right form. So it's worth reminding ourselves, even when we're talking about AI, that you know, around one in five hospitals in the UK are still largely paper-based. So that there is a challenge, a prosaic but important challenge around you know, di digitization. Uh, we've talked about standardization, which is hugely important as well. I think the diversity of data is, 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 is a pretty important issue. I was just reminded this week that, you know, I think is it not is it over 90%? I think I'm right here of genomic. Um, a se sequence genomic data is from white male Europeans or so, so, something uh, so, something of that order of magnitude. So we need the diversity of data as well as the quality of data. Uh, and then there's something about the link to my first point really is about secure data environments. So one of the preconditions for, 
for, for, for the next steps, as I understand it, on the GP data sharing is creating a trusted research environment that people can have confidence in uh, and, and making sure that those kinds of models, if you like, sort of reference libraries for researchers in a digital world are secure, have the public confidence, but also allow that space for innovation uh, um, I, is one of the critical next steps as I would see it. Thanks, Jacob. Um, you're absolutely right about the challenges of um, genomic uh, data sets and uh, the problems with um, diversity within them. Uh, but you'll be pleased to know that it's one of our priority work streams at, at Genomics England, and we are working on diversifying that data set and sequencing different communities at the moment and understanding um, how we can do better at that. And so um, any partners who want to come forward and talk to us about how we can do that better, we would be delighted to hear from you. Um, now, I'm going to ask one more infrastructure question about how we can unlock um, this innovation more effectively here in the UK. And that's about you know, getting regulation right, um, because Jacob, you mentioned uh, that it's in the area of diagnostics that there's the most um, near term um, opportunity and that about half of approvals have come in that area. How do we get this right touch regulation um, in place in order to not just unlock uh, the innovation and give certainly to invest in innovations, but also to accelerate adoption, give clinicians and patients confidence in standards? I'm going to start with you, Jacob. I know you've just answered, but you, you were the person who mentioned that. Yeah, I think terrific question. I, I don't have the full answer, but between Sam and Pear, I'm sure they will. I, I think the I think the UK is is quite pro AI um, uh, and it, it is, wants to create the right regulatory framework. A everyone is feeling their way, though, a little bit. Um, you know, we have got some um, some new guidelines from the EU, which I think are. Uh, not a bad place to to compare notes with, you know, smart regulation. As I think about it, is is as I think you're alluding to, Nicola, trying to find that sweet spot between um, creating an environment uh, where innovation can can really thrive whilst maintaining the trust in AI. And we, you know, we're at a critical point, I think, where there are some concerns around data and new technologies and and and, and approaches like AI, which could undermine, could set back the public confidence if we're not careful. So whilst, you know, pace is admirable, let's let's avoid haste. And I think I would probably up emphasize three priorities, privacy, security and trust, you know, framed around consent and transparency um, and, and ensuring that providers are only using the data for a tightly coupled and, and clearly understood purpose and not trying to monetize the data, I guess, in particular for in unethical ways, which is probably one of the public's main concerns. Mm, absolutely. Um, Sam. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things. I think what we did learn from the pandemic is that we can get the regulation light touch and still safe and effective. And, and a brilliant example of that, of course, was MHRA. And I think we should be looking at some of the things that we adopted during the pandemic um, to the regulatory approaches to this particular challenge and dilemma. I also think, um, going back to your point, Jacob, about um, trust and discrete data sets and things, we, we almost need to set nationally an expectation that data, um, although it must be used ethically and for the right purposes, that it, it needs to be shared in, in a more collective, larger way. Because what I'm hearing from um, digital healthcare startup firms who, who, for some reason, ring me on a regular basis for chats, is that they can't get access into the system to even showcase the innovation they, they are demonstrating. So there, some of them have got some brilliant tools and it's partly because um, when they approach trusts or healthcare providers, they're being rooted via the IT or the CIO um, uh, departments and being told, well, actually, we want to do all this ourselves in-house. We, we, we can develop all these solutions ourselves because, of course, of course they could, but that's a very ambitious challenge to do everything yourself. But also they're, they're very concerned about the data connectivity and, and how that might op operate with their, their system. So I do, I do think um, there needs to be some kind of national um, uh, messaging about how important this is to get the data connected for everyone in a way that isn't sort of creating all these mini silos right across the whole healthcare system. And I know there's lots of talk about this, but I think there needs to be some really clear um, cultural directives around how this should be enabled, and then a clear light of touch regulatory approach based on some of the learning we've already had in the pandemic. Thanks, Sam. 
Uh, Pear, you must have been uh, through this uh, delightful experience. Um, yeah, what? absolutely. And and first, let me first say that I'm absolutely sharing the views of uh, Jacob and Sam. So so let me instead of sort of just sort of filling up on the same, but sort of coming up with an additional point. Being uh, and being in the surgical robotic area is obviously a highly regulated product. And uh, so one thing obviously is to have clear guidelines and regulations in the UK, but being and trying to be a global company, I would even say it would really be helpful if obviously the UK regulations are very much uh, aligned with what we will see in other parts of the world, obviously with FDA, with the, the, rest, of the uh, rest of Europe. And uh, that is actually one of the things for me which is important in all kind of regulatory work is that uh, obviously clear guidelines, but that they are also able to um, harmonize between the different regulatory bodies, because otherwise as the company is getting pretty tricky if you're going to treat um, the digital and the, the digital and the machine learning type of services very differently from country to country. Yes, I, I, um, certainty and consistency is always useful when you're trying to build something, I can understand. Um, I, I, I want to come back to this question about public confidence and ethics, um, but perhaps I think it would be helpful if we look ahead a little bit about where we're going and in the context of that, think about how we build public confidence and take the take public with us as, as that happens. So I, I want to ask, you know, what, what do you think, what is your vision for the most promising solutions that are coming forward for maybe first provider and clinician productivity and, imp and improving quality of care um, in that way. You know, some examples were already given uh, by you, Jacob, um, in your opening. So perhaps you, you could kick us off on this and, and just give us a sense of where we might be heading. Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. So, so I'd probably start with this issue of ambient clinical intelligence actually so which is a or, or some people call it conversational ai or more simply it's it's really about the power of voice recognition um so earlier this year uh, microsoft announced the acquisition or forthcoming acquisition of nuance who are a very big provider in this field so, so good we bought the company i guess you could say and their their technology one of the key technologies is dragon ambient experience and what that does is it transcribes and diarizes the entire patient clinician and, and interaction and then summarizes that data for for the clinician to, and and adds it automatically to the EHR in a in a structured form in a way that you know if you think of your you know your visit to the GP or to your hospital consultant it's, it's a very different model as we have it currently um, so we're we're really excited about the potential for that. It's it's a it's a technology. Uh, at least some forms that has already heavily penetrated into the the U.S. hospital market. I think over seventy five percent of hospitals use Nuance in some form. So I think there's huge potential there, um, uh, both to improve the clinician patient experience, to to address clinical um, burnout and and satisfaction in in, in work, um, and and to drive wider efficiency. So I'm really excited about the potential there. And, and obviously, um, Per, your technology is specifically developed for this purpose. Uh, give us a sense of what that will mean in practice um, in, in the clinic, in hospitals, in workflows. What, what, what will happen? I think what, what we are working on and, uh, and some of the trends I clearly see, I would, say, I would say there are two main directions. We see clearly uh, digital machine learning and AI being there to help to train the, the surgical teams, so the surgeon in himself and the, and, and the surgical team. Uh, giving them data, um, I heard Jacob was sort of talking about the digital um, Spotify, I think you said. I am very often actually looking at it also almost like a Strava for those that are are using Strava. If you do sports, you can sort of see your, your performance versus, let's say, an average. And uh, that's clearly an area where we do believe that uh, we will see going forward that we gather information from, from thousands of surgeons across the world, but then that gets sort of put together as an average and then each individual doctor can see their performance. And for other type of product, that could be everything as simple as just how efficient do you use your hands in 3D? Um, how do you move the instrument uh, during a surgery inside some of the cavities? 
Um, so that's one part of it. Uh, the whole, um, the, yeah, the whole sort of comparing a doctor to uh, to an average to, to help them to sort of improve and be more efficient and do and, and give better and safer uh, care. The other part is then again, which really also um, COVID has actually driven for us. During COVID and when we wanted to have new hospitals starting up with um, with surgeries and using robotic, we have we had to do that from the UK all the way over to Australia. We couldn't really travel, so we have developed quite a lot of new training um, types. So using um, virtual reality uh, as an example, we are able to actually have the doctors and the, the, the operating theater teams actually uh, getting trained by very skilled uh, experts while still being in a completely different type of the world. So two examples uh, from what, what we are working on. And I, and I think that I'm just using them as examples of what to do today because I think that are two very distinct areas where I do believe and expect it to be just much more uh, development moving in the next five to 10 years. Brilliant. Now, Sam, you have two perspectives on this because you have the perspective as someone who would have been um, in procurement, I suppose, in, in, the, in the hospital um, wanting to um, use these technologies. But now you are a researcher um, and, and part of the um, discovery science. And so, you know, from those two perspectives, where do you see um, the most exciting um, potential in, in the near to medium term? Um, well, I just wanted to say um, one thing about um, the ethical piece that you mentioned, Nicola, and I'll go on to sort of something I think is very exciting in um, the research um, side. So I, I, I do think that um, the, the patients and clinicians um, have a very strong uh, why. So there's a very strong why we should improve the whole um, reason um, we are collecting clinical data and, and the way we're using clinical data and, and many, many patients actually don't understand why when they go from one healthcare part of the system to another, there is not a join up of their data and we very happily allow that to happen. And I think probably giving the patients more personal control of their own data, that's why I talked in my intro about and then being able to access their own health records, results, etc. And then they allow the permissions to have that wider uh, sharing is a good place to start um, to overcome some of those trust issues. And I think with AI, um, we probably to start with, as, as we transform patient care with the use of these assistive tools, we just need to have it a little bit more in the background that rather than front and centre. And I think that will people will, will start using all these technologies and not even be particularly aware that AI is powering some of them and that I think will get again over some of these sort of doubts and concerns because they'll see the usefulness of them once they're being used in practice and so I think that, that that's one bit um, and then moving on to um, re research I mean the reason I particularly mentioned AlphaFold in, the, in my intro and um, the, the, the potential to uh, really power up and, and speed up discovery science is um, because clearly if we can get um, machine learning and AI working effectively there really is massive potential and I'll just give you one a couple of examples maybe from the from the Crick one of our scientists at the Crick Sonia Gandhi is researching Parkinson's disease and she's actually taking patient drive cells which she transforms into stem cells and then on into neurons. She gets thousands of images of those cells and the machine learning looks for hidden patterns in the data set and although it's still at the early stages she's now able to predict with greater than 90% accuracy um, that whether a stem cell derived neuron is going to become um, a, a patient is going to get the Parkinson's disease or it is a help from a healthy control and I suppose the implications of that in the future is that you'll be able to therefore detect um, whether somebody's likely to develop something like Parkinson's disease at an incredibly early stage and also work out what personalised therapies you need to give because actually Parkinson's is actually probably not just one disease but has many subtypes Another, another scientist at the Crick is looking at genomic evolution and the use of imagery and basically looking at tumour biopsies and looking um, at um, how they evolve, at how the disease evolves 
and then able to work out potentially what, again, ther specific therapies might be needed um, depending on the level of risk um, of that particular um, tumour of how it might develop. So there's all sorts of uh, applications that can be used in discovery science of machine learning and AI. But I think, and again, going back to my ethical bit I mentioned at the beginning, I don't think um, patients or clinicians will mind that application if it's if it's clearly being used for an incredible um, the useful um, endpoint, the solution of helping treatments for, say, Parkinson's or other many other diseases, providing those data sets are governed, there's the right um, management of those data sets in place. And that goes back to that national piece about how we, we make sure there is the right regulatory framework that is not too unwieldy, too cumbersome, um, and allows an, an, an agility of approach for these emerging um, technologies and AI approaches. That, that's a really helpful framing, actually, Sam, to take us on. I, what you've essentially um, put out there is that um, we would have greater support or greater confidence in health data sharing for these um, particular applications if um, the benefits came closer to patients and they had more control. So, I mean, what we haven't discussed is um, out of hospital or um, out of um, cl cl clinical environment healthcare applications. Um, for patients and what the potential is there and um, how that might change um, public view of some of these um, technologies and health data sharing for those purposes. I mean, I wonder, Jacob, um, in, in your um, experience, what, what's your view? Well, there's so much going on, right? I, I think sometimes it, it, it's hard to it's hard to focus in. I, I think there's a very obvious example um, in, in COVID of the sort of public acceptance of, uh, you know, of healthcare related technologies in the NHS app. So several million people using it now. So so, the, so ubiquitous, we almost don't talk about so much. Viewing your health record, making appointments, viewing your vaccine status, not uncontested by everyone, but um, I think a big step forward. Um, maybe at the other end of the spectrum, uh, so, so not, not so visible, but I think really exciting. We're doing a project uh, with the team down at Southampton. Uh, my medical records are a personal health records. So, um, you know, a number of companies have tried to make this work, including Microsoft in the past. And, uh, and uh, you know, how, how can you put the data in the patient's own hands? Uh, so I think that's a that's that's now um, live with around 50,000 patients down in Southampton, where the records jointly managed by the patient and their care team. Um, so it's quite a different model. That, I think that's really exciting. And then, um, you know, I'm. I, I think if you you think about some of the consumer technology, you know, the the Apple Watch. Um, has uh, is is really interesting uh, as an example, not both for how it can help support people manage their own well-being, uh, but actually driving new models of research. I think the Apple Heart Study had something like 400,000 uh, participants. That's unheard of in any normal clinical trial. So there's there's applications actually for for you know going back to my point about the convergence of research technology and healthcare. I think that's a, that's a neat example. So I, I think there's there's so much going on really. Um, connectivity back into the healthcare system is really important though. So sort of standalone apps that don't uh, support clinical workflows and, and don't connect the data are, are, are probably have limited um, uh, long-term significance in my view. Yeah. That, uh, this is important. The things that we shouldn't do are almost as important as the things that we should do. And, and Per, you started us off with this. There's a lot of hype um, and actually, hype that doesn't deliver undermines public confidence. And we have to be particularly careful in this because we are using that most precious resource, which is, you know, an individual's health data, um, that kind of, in, you know, very um, central part of someone's identity in order to deliver a healthcare application to improve quality of care and save lives. But nevertheless, you are, you know, asking someone to trust you with that. So you have to be careful. Um, to not go down the routes which are just hype driven. So in terms of um, the areas where you think we shouldn't be going, what, where do you think the hype lies? Where do you think um, there is um, less opportunity? Yeah, I mean, if I if I if I will sort of speak an experience from CMR surgical, I think uh, autonomous uh, surgery is sort of probably the topic that comes to my mind the first. Uh, still, quite frequently, when I talk to people, they will almost believe that there are some kind of an uh, of an automation uh, in in performing surgery with the help of of a robotic solution. 
and uh, it's not that I completely rule it out for extremely uh, long time in the future, but I think short term, I uh, that would be the topic for me. I, I do still believe that we need uh, the certain to actually make the decision, uh, do the assessment of what's going on during the surgery. Uh, um, he, I think we can develop solutions where they can get support, where they can get, as I mentioned, maybe no-go zones or an alarm if they go cl too close with a, with a, with a, with a sharp uh, instrument, for instance. But the, the sometimes the discussions around a complete autonomous surgery where kind of the, the robot will do that it by itself, I think is still quite a hype and I think it is quite a few years uh, away from, from reality. Um, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very good point you make, um, Per, about, uh, you know, the workforce issues. I think there's been a lot of hype about how um, technology can replace um, uh, workforce and um, can make a big difference to, say, um, backlog and efficiency of, of, of healthcare. I think I think it will absolutely um, have a really useful role and, and really um, help um, clinicians and patients to have a much better experience. And uh, but I don't think it, it that it's a long way off replacing key personnel. And at the moment, if anything, it will just help with the additional um, burden that's coming our way as as our populations get older and there's more healthcare needs rather than um, be substitutional. Jacob. Two thoughts from me. Um, the, the first is, you know, AI machine learning, I, I think augment not replace is the phrase to keep in mind. And that's why we put sort of human centered design at the heart of the, the work we do. So it's thinking about how it supports workflow, supports humans, both caregivers and, and, and patients. Um, rather than replacing them outright. So there's a bit of hype around, you know, replacement as a theme overall. Uh, um, and then my second reflection was was actually on the demand side rather than the supply side, which is about organisational capability. You know, we've talked already about the data, but the, 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 the skills and the people to be able to to do um, machine learning, AI, I think is, you know, we possibly we overestimate that. So there's probably there's more potential in, in, you know, the application of pre-trained models, but sort of customer trained machine learning models. You know, most organizations don't have the, the, you know, the data or the skills to be able to develop them. And so I think sometimes there's a bit of a mismatch in the conversation between the, the kind of technologies, the kind of algorithms that are available and the, and the kinds of organizations that can actually put them into practice. So this takes me on to my last question, because unfortunately we are running out of time and I think we could talk about this all day because it's fascinating. But um, th this is really important because it is the capacity of the health system um, and, and your um, health environment to actually adopt the innovation and, and the readiness and the skills and, and so on. And so what what do you what what do you what is your estimation of um, the readiness of the health system to adopt um, the technologies which are available now? What have been the barriers and the challenges which you faced? A and B. Um, what what is your estimation of what we need to do in order to improve that and accelerate adoption to improve care and, and do all the things that we've been talking about and and realise this great vision? I'll start with you, Pat. I mean, my experience, uh, and if I focus then mostly on the UK, is that there is actually a strong willingness uh, to invest in new technologies. Um, talking to many of the execs uh, out of the NHS hospitals, I think there is even becoming almost a, a part of the, the need almost to recruit uh, staff at hospitals today to actually in, in the competition, uh, which you can claim if that's good or bad, but uh, that's one of the one of the feedbacks I get all the time. But I clearly see a, a, a wish. Uh, obviously, some of the challenges are, of course, the cost element of it. So it is uh, to find the right balance um uh, the right balance and as long as we are able to come up with technology that also obviously bring uh, benefit and bring value uh, to the hospitals to the patients uh, and to all the staff i think actually we will see uh, an increase and in uptake of technology being 
what we are dealing with, surgical robotic or other type of, of, of technologies, and including, of course, uh, AI and machine learning in some kind of support form and not replacement, as we just discussed. Thanks, Matt. Sam? So, so, I mean, I think this is the age old question, isn't it, about how do you adopt innovation across any kind of um, ecosystem? And obviously, you always see this highly variable element where some some are really leading edge and some are so far behind. You think, oh, really, you know, and, and I think this is, is the case with um, this kind of technology in, in, in healthcare. I think um, you need to probably set the expectation at national level um, and really inspire and showcase some of the best practice. I think you've got to get um, uh, make those challenges easier for um, the different healthcare um, systems and providers so that, they, that, that when they have the will, it's not all so very ridiculously difficult for them to um, make it happen. And that is it does involve things like the financials and the contracting issues and as, as well as the regulatory issues. I do think there is, as Pat Jacob's point about a skill um, a skill gap, in uh, and I think you need more people that are, are, are fluent and understand this world embedded within these healthcare systems. Um, and then I do think the, um, the 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 startups and the, the incredibly entrepreneurial um, healthcare and, and, and other uh, firms, AI and machine learning firms, etc., need to find an easier route in, um, and that needs to be enabled more for them so that they can at least have some starter conversations. And at the moment, I think they're being um, they're they're finding that that hurdle quite difficult to to overcome, even though they might have an excellent product and I think again that's partly the way that um, that they're enabled and, and rooted through a, say a hospital system perhaps through um, the CIO or the IT, IT um, workforce who may be very very positive but at, at other times want to sort of um, to do it all in-house and I, and I think that's probably a bit too ambitious them, of them as well so I think there's a whole set of things that need to be thought about in order to make um, this adoption more widespread um, rather than as patchy as it is now. Thanks, Sam. I think that, that's the voice of experience I can hear there. So, so I mean, so Jacob, some of it's structural, some of it's cultural. Um, what's your experience been? A couple of additional points, perhaps. Uh, you start, start with the low hanging fruit, you know, get, going back to Sam's really important point earlier, what are the clinical, uh, examples that are really going to resonate with the public and uh, and for me that's around how we you know help people who have missed appointments for suspected cancers say um uh, where we know there's huge backlogs and and that, that's where you're going to on the public side i think um likely to get more adoption the the, the other low bit of low hanging fruit i think is which we haven't talked about as much is around you know machine learning applications for um, you know, for, for operational use, if you like, I, I don't mean the, the surgical theatre, I, I, I mean the, the, the back office, how to automate workflows, how to automate supply chains, you know, for, for pharma, that's the both the manufacturing supply chain, but also the, the, the supply chain for clinical drugs for trials. These are really important, um, you know, perhaps less visible um, problems of optimization for which machine learning tools are, are really potentially really powerful. And so that's the first bit is around low hanging fruit. I think the second bit, uh, you know, and I would say this because we're a cloud technology provider, but you, we need we need the computing infrastructure in place. And we have this, you know, this very broad distribution, uh, you know, one in five hospitals without, you know, with paper records, more or less, uh, you know, right through to some real digital exemplars. And we need to, you know, we, we, we need to upgrade the infrastructure as a whole, because particularly the, the more we're working as systems, um, you know, the, the, the less we can leave anyone behind in in a technological fashion, and then the final point I think is 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 that one around is that one around skills and people, um, and that there are ways in which not everyone's going to be a de developer needs to be a developer, but in but both increasing the, the the hard technical skills, you know, growing that cohort, and Microsoft have with others have invested significantly in that with the NHS and and other partners, but also. Um, if you like democratizing data science, you you know expanding people's uh, ability, facility, um, willingness to engage with 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 data and technology, because I think overall that lifts the tide. Jacob, thank you so much.
Well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of the time that we have for our session uh, today, but I want to uh, thank the entire panel for what has been a really fascinating and in-depth uh, discussion. We've heard about your vision for AI over the next decade. We've discussed you know, the infrastructure that needs to underpin that from regulation to public confidence. We've talked about you know, your vision for the most exciting opportunities and also how you could actually um, get that adopted and driven through the healthcare system in a really real way. And what's most exciting for me is all of this has been grounded in the reality of people who are actually doing it on the ground today. So, um, Pear, Jacob, Sam, can I say thank you so much for your time today. And to everyone um, who is out there listening, um, enjoy the rest of uh, London Tech Week and the Health Tech Summit. Uh, goodbye from me. Um, and uh, enjoy your session. Bye bye. 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 Bye.